Welcome to the Jeremy Ryan Houchins podcast. So happy to have my guest today, Pastor Ron. Uh, I'm really excited to have you here. And uh, I've been wanting to have you on this podcast. Well, even before I started the podcast, you were one of my top five guests that I actually wanted to have. I had scribbled down probably 15, 20 names. And uh, you're a hard person to reach sometimes. But finally made this happen. I'm so glad to have you. Well, it's good to be here as well. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself. So you're a pastor um, in Wichita Falls, but tell me how you became a pastor and tell me a little bit about your history and in ministry and things like that. Well, I have been here a little over 20 years, um, pastored previously to that in Dallas at a, actually Mesquite, uh, Grace Assembly of God Church. And then prior to that, uh, um, missionary, well, evangelist, and did missions work in Africa for about nine years, and then a couple of staff positions, and, and that that's kind of my ministry story as far as, as the years yeah. um, related to that. Well, it's a lot of years to be combined in about 30 seconds, so I'm sure we'll get to, <laughs> we'll unpack a little bit more of that. But uh, how did you get into it? Your were your parents uh, in ministry? Yeah, my dad was a pastor, actually, so I'm a preacher's kid. Um, I, I tell everybody I'm a... Typical I'm a, rebellion in that? Oh, uh, yeah, well, we'll we'll dive into... <laughs> I don't know how far we want to dive into that, uh, how much my kids want to hear. But, um, uh, yeah, they were. I tell everybody um, I, I'm a thoroughbred, actually, and to be a thoroughbred, you have, both parents have to be registered, you mm-hmm. know, so... Uh, sure. My mom's also uh, was a... A lady in our denomination, women in ministry, was a has always been a positive thing. The right. assemblies of God. So, mother was a was a lady evangelist, uh, and that's how she met my dad. And so, so that was the that's where the journey started. But uh, uh, growing up, mom and dad never encouraged uh, me to the ministry at all. They their thought process, even after I told them I felt a calling to ministry, that um, they didn't encourage that. They, in fact, they tried to. They discouraged it. If they, their thought process was that if the Lord's called him, then he doesn't run need after. our help. Yeah, sure. he'll chase after. But that's not where I started. I, I actually wanted to go into the Air Force. Uh, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, um, I, I I pursued that privately. I have a. I'm not current or. It's been a while, but I have a private pilot's license as well. So wow. So, uh, but um, so I, my thought process was you have to. Have, I thought you had to have a degree to get to the Air Force Academy. So I, I started that journey. Um, business and ed- uh, accounting was uh, numbers are easy for me, and so that's that's where I was headed to get a degree. In so you're one of those in accounting. People. Yeah, I guess yeah. <laughs> whatever. There's whatever very those few who like are. numbers, but oh no, I uh, I comes natural t- for some. Well, it's uh, yeah, yeah, numbers don't bother me at all. You know, tracing out budgets. Uh, I sit on a budget committee for our denomination uh, district office, and so so fun looking at but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yay. i can tell that's not your uh, uh i mean i like uh if i if it has to if it's money i i'm i'm fine but just but <laughs> just numbers in general no but yeah um so your parents were ministers um and so that transition you started going towards the air force what 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 threw the wrench into those plans you know actually it was in my between my sophomore and junior year, I was attending uh, of college or of, high school. Of college, okay. no, um, I was attending. Uh, I went to a different. I don't. I don't uh, advise this track for anyone. I didn't go to one school four years. I went to uh, four four schools in yeah. one year. You just wanted to <laughs> type, look around. Type that's of all. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so I started at South Plains Junior College, which is in Leveland, Texas, and. And spent a year there because my folks lived in Littlefield, so I mm. I I lived at home and uh, did you know uh, saved money to where you could get uh, and and back in that day they had uh, for those who were not high income low income there was some something called the B E O G Basic Education Opportunity Grant yeah and so. Um, 
um, so I went to South Plains Junior College a year. Then I went to UTEP in El Paso for a year. And even in that time, though, you know, I took Bible classes. So there, I mean, the calling was there. The calling actually started when I was 10 years old with a missionary that came to our church. Uh, you know him, actually, Ben mm-hmm. Tipton. Yeah, uh, he's a good man. I talked to him. <laughs> I talked to him a couple times a month. So he's a, I consider him a mentor of mine. So. Yeah. So he, uh, he, he came to the, came to our church and that, that started the process. But, uh, so I went to UTEP for a year and came home and started it at Texas Tech because then you're getting into your junior year and tech is a good school for accounting. Sure. And uh, it was between the uh, Christmas break, um, the second semester of, of um, uh, going to tech that uh, we had a, had a young man that came to mom and dad's church that I led to the Lord and in that in that experience there was a just a an understanding that that was that that was where the the calling was renewed i think i'd probably ran you know you, yeah fueled the god fire. chases yeah. after you you know sure. and so so i have been i had not been very cooperative in uh in in pursuing that um that calling um because i was going to do other things so then i went to uh i, I transferred to southwestern our we have a bible school in waxahachie and i attended there for um for a year and that basically got me i I lost a few hours i basically got me to my senior year and between your junior and senior year you do an internship if you when you had a ministry i have a bachelor's in theology and so you, you did a internship, and so I went to Illinois, Quincy, Illinois, and, and served as a youth pastor, and then that started the journey. Served in a church in Colorado and then into the uh, eva- evangelism, and mm-hmm. there that's that's where it kind of got started. Yeah. So you evangelism, uh, what, what did that look like? Did you just visit uh, school campuses? Were you a guest speaker at churches? What... What yeah, your, probably. What I, I, I know that's evolved over time too. Yeah, well, it, evangelists that, and that's right. I think it it it, uh, it probably revivalist might be a sure maybe a better term at that for what time. we at, at what we did. Yeah. You know, it was it wasn't it wasn't crusades. Sure. You know, designed to where you're just reaching the lost. It was revivals for churches. So yeah. you you go create to a churches. spark. Yeah, yeah. So, I would do that for nine months, and then I would spend three months in Africa in uh, with Ben Tipton, mm-hmm. uh, uh, starting churches, planning churches, in primarily West Africa. What is the difference uh, that you would see uh, at that specific time? What what era are we talking about? I'm not trying to age you or anything. I'm just trying no, to get it's a okay. perspective. I'm, I'm 63, so. Yeah. So that perspective, what was that like in the era of the American church versus the African uh, Christian church? I mean, how was what was the contrast there? You know, it's really interesting. I mean, culturally, when I when I f- started going to Africa, um, you know, they were. I guess you you might say they were. I don't want to say the infant stages because missionaries had been going to Africa for you know, 40 or 50 years. But I mean, I think the, the, there's a maturation process, but even culturally, um, you know, when I first started going to Africa and West Africa, it was, I I don't want to say primitive. And I think part of it depended on where you were at, Mm -hmm. what, what, where you were at. So I'm, I'll I'll chase I'll get on a little soapbox. No, here yeah, chase absolutely. A little bit of chase sure. a little bit of a rabbit, but um, because I've kind of seen a cultural sh- a shift mm-hmm. when I first went to Africa, you know, um, women were I I wasn't quite in the area of going to Africa where people were not clothed, but it was you know it was primitive close. It was more primitive. Mm-hmm. Um, um and the clothing was optional <laughs> yeah yeah there was part parts of that yeah a lot of um 
tribal marks. They had, you know, they they would have scars or mm-hmm. what various tribal marks. A lot of tattooing. Uh, that was and and all that was indication of a culture that was um, coming, what I would say, out of darkness into light. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was it a, bib- the first time you saw it. Was it like culture shock, or not really? The first time that I went, um, uh, yeah. I mean, my my first trip was there's there's always culture shock, you yeah. know, when you've not been anywhere. So, the first uh, ten days, it was actually my first trip to Africa that I got connected with Ben at the very end of it, and God directs our steps. Yeah. But uh, so watching that, you know, now obviously the continent of Africa and the church, it's it's totally different. They have progressed and they've yeah, it's flourished away. Yeah. Contrary, and this will make some of your uh, listeners probably not real happy. You know, I'm I'm pretty conservative. Yeah, we don't care. That's but cool. what I but what I've observed is the American culture is headed the opposite direction. Yeah. You know, uh, and I've spoken on that several times before. And so in the so when I was going in the eighties, I mean, you had the you had the tattooing and the and the tribal marks, and and they've moved away from that. Whereas American culture has moved towards that, you know, and that's kind of been an observation that you wouldn't have a perspective that you wouldn't have if you not had not seen that. Yeah, back in the seventies and eighties, no one. I mean. Your sailors and different, you know, military people had tattoos, and right. maybe there was a it was a negative kind of connotation. Sure. Obviously, that's not true today, yeah. but it is it it shows to me at least where our where our culture has has an outward has sign moved. of our culture is what you're yeah saying. an outward sign of our culture. Um, so you're doing evangelism for nine years. What decide what? Why did you decide to take up the mantle of? pastorship what what led to that transition i don't know that anything led to it other than just a um just the the burden lifted i i don't know how else to phrase that it it, just in my heart i just as i started that journey because the journey started or at least the missions aspect of it i was uh conducting a revival in um in Louisiana, West Monroe, Louisiana, and and the Spirit of God was really dealing with my heart, and so I committed two or three days to fasting and prayer, and you know the uh, seeking the Lord's will, His direction, and and at the end of it was very specific actually. At the end of that uh, three days, the second or third day, end of the third day, the the, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart, to my mind. You know, I've never heard God speak audibly, but mm-hmm. you know, the, the sure. thoughts that come to our mind. That's still I small voice, Greg. He, spe- he speaks yeah. to our heart. It was very specific. It, it uh, This was October, and um, he spoke to my heart and said, in December, I'm going to open a door for you to walk in. And mm-hmm. when that thought came to my mind, the heaviness of spirit lifted. Uh, there was joy. There was peace, which is... A good indication. Uh, a, a good indication of sure. that. And so I was home for Christmas, and my mother and I, my dad was sick at the time, and uh, we, mom said, hey, I've got a, uh, she was the women's director for um, the, the the district, the West Texas district, and so she said, so. And you've stayed a, within Assembly of God denomination this entire time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All, and yeah, your parents my as well. Life, my parents yeah. as well. Okay. So she said, I've got a meal with a missionary. Let's, uh, why don't you go with me? So I went, and um, John Goodwin, uh, he was a missionary to Ghana. Um, he, he invited me. He said, hey, I'm going, I'm going back to Ghana next month. Why don't you go with me? Well, three months prior, the Lord had specifically told my heart that a, a door of opportunity would open in December. Sure. And so, you know, I mean, that's very, specific. that's very specific. Sure. So I knew that that was uh, the will of the Lord. And so I went and it, uh, John's emphasis, he was, a, he was a pioneer really of of um, medical missions okay. or, you know, I mean, our, the, 
the Assemblies of God missions emphasis in earlier days was strictly evangelism and sure. and by Bible schools and you know they they were not as much into you know medical missions and doing some of the other social type of things right. that was kind of frowned on or that was my perspective anyway. And uh, so I went with him, and and of course, his calling was not my calling, you know. But uh, we went. Uh, uh, the country of Ghana at that time was very. Um, it was it, it it was not as advanced as it is now. I A mean, little chaotic. It, yeah, chaotic. I think, and some of that had to do with government leadership. It always does. Yes, and it's amazing how <laughs> government leadership <laughs> affects yeah. things. And so the infrastructure was not very good. And so it took us several days to get to where his, where he base was stationed, right. his base of operation. And so all kinds of experiences with that. But in that, I thought, you know, what am I doing here? I was the culture shock had also kicked in pretty heavily because it was uh, where we were at because we weren't we weren't on a safari and yeah. uh, we weren't in uh, a, a pretty part of Africa there right. were some beautiful parts of Africa but that is that wasn't one that of wasn't them the one you at, went to. at that time at that period there's some beautiful parts of Ghana I'm not saying anything about the country right. of Ghana right. negative but uh, um, but it was just a rougher road. Yeah, it was just a d- 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 more difficult time. It yeah. was a rougher road. I mean, you could Which you uh, you don't. I mean, you don't always pick where God has you go. No. So whenever you so. went, for example, whenever you packed, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted any kind of American flavors from home, you packed that in a suitcase yeah. because when you got there, those things were gone. You better, <laughs> yeah. you better pack your, sure. your favorite shampoo and soap and whatever, because yeah. all that. So that's what I'm saying. It, right. Obviously that's not true now. I mean, right. you can go to those countries in Africa and, and, and they have McDonald's and they have everything, you know, they have, but it I was think, just a different era. You know, era, and era. I think though within that era, I, I listen to other podcasts and I I've touched on this with other um, guests and things is that 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 mindset of suffering for Christ is almost trying to be eliminated in a sense like it's okay to go without certain things too you know in that era you didn't really have a choice but now it's like and I'm not saying just to like you know sub texts of Catholicism where they're flogging each other. I'm not saying that we purposely suffer just for the sake of suffering, but I think there's this mindset also that's becoming more and more prevalent that let's do everything that we possibly can to not have any suffering anywhere we go. I, do you do you, do you see that kind of permeating within missionary and church culture to some degree? You know, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not as in as in much of a connection with, uh, at that time, I, I traveled all the time, mm-hmm. you know, so I could really speak to that, you know, since you're, when you pastor a church, obviously you have other priorities. So my, my trips to Africa, even though we've made not there may have been a few years a couple of years that we didn't make trips you know um covid would have been one year sure. and there are a few 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 years but so when you go and you just spend two weeks it's it, it it's hard to uh to to know or to, to see that culture wise yeah. however and and i think the 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 missionaries that i am have connection with uh they still um they go to difficult places. Yeah, and um, I was at our. We have a, a a general council. We call it every two years, and and I was speaking to some missionaries who were from South Africa. And as you are aware, it hasn't been that long ago that there was rioting and apartheid. Quite, yeah. Uh, well, even uh, two months ago, two or three months ago, the yeah. the rioting that was taking place in South Africa. And uh, that uh, was within two or three blocks of where they lived. Yeah. And so, so you know, we have missionaries that still go to difficult places. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm just saying that, well, we'll get into that down the road. But No, I do think there's an aversion. I mean, sure, there's a, there's a natural human aversion to that. You know, even as Christians, though, it's... Uh, I, think there, I think there's yes and no. 
I think there is a natural, but I think that um, I think that there's there's a time, and I think there's a certain mindset that you have to have, right? And yes, I think our natural flesh, but we're supposed to fight against our natural flesh, sure. right? So, but I mean, if you see uh, throughout the New Testament, and you overlay that with the current, you know, whether Paul in Corinthians, he it goes through his. Uh, that he was beaten with rods and flogged, all these different things. I mean, he didn't like avert himself from putting himself in those positions, regardless of outcome. And so, I think there's right. this aversion now to, um, like you know, people are like, "Well, thank God there's Wi-Fi there, and you know, there's you know different things." It there's just a ver- it, there's aversion in the American church. Yeah, in the American church, there's aversion to the suffering aspect of it for Christ, you know, which concerns me in the long term because, you know, you historically good times don't always last, you know? And so, you know, I, Jesus even, even mentioned that summer uh, seed is thrown on stony ground. It, it, it springs up, but the cares of the world and then it shrinks down because there's no root. And I just, I'm concerned that, you know, in what I see, even with culturally with American, um, with, the generations coming up uh, that their aversion to comfort like there are children who are are born in america raised in america have and their suffering in america is not the suffering of the world right of of different places you know even the poorest in america have it way better than two-thirds of the rest of the world in a lot of ways just the fact that they could get food um, and so because there's so many government programs, all these different things. And so what my concern is, is that like I see and I and I own a business, I see hiring processes and things like that and all these different things coming about. I see that there's this aversion to any type of suffering, any type of hard work and how that translates into ministry, not just here, but abroad. You know, I had talked with Jordan a little bit about that. And, you know, I know and I've talked to other people in other um, denominations apart from just assembly of God. And it just seems like there's this lack of interest, not like there once was in say 50, 60, 70s of people coming into going in, not just to ministry, but going into mission specific. Well, I think your first generation, I mean, first generation believers, I mean, you mentioned the apostle Paul, he was obviously first generation right. at the church. And so, the groundwork that they would have laid would have been suffering. Sure. You know, first generation missionaries from America, when they got on ships to go, they, they packed their belongings in coffins. Yeah. Some, I mean, they, they, they went with the full knowledge and expectation that they would give their life physically for, for the, the cause of Christ. That's first generation, Sure. you know, and, and uh, my argument is, I think that every generation has to have that mindset to be a follower of Christ. Well, and and uh, that is, um, I think you're right. I, I, the state, I don't disagree with the statement. I'm, I'm thinking of us, our culture, I mean, sure. you know, thinking culturally in the, in the American church, because I'm trying to think what generation I would be. I would probably You'd be, be boomer. third or fourth generation. Yeah. Um, it, it, as far as, our denomination, obviously, Christianity sure, within goes a lot, of God. Goes, yeah. goes a lot deeper than that, and so I'm thinking of, you know, I I I, I believe that that's I, th- I believe that that's uh, uh, true. We when I went into ministry, there was no thought process of uh, money was not the object objective at all. Oh, for you know, sure. What yeah. you, what you made? Yeah, I don't think you go in a minute. I hope you don't go in a ministry well, for money. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a lot of money in it. No, I mean, it, if you're doing it the right way, probably. I guess. I mean, there's some oh, charlatans uh, out there that uh, do. If it you mean if money. you're doing it the wrong way, yeah, then there is exactly. money in it. If you're doing it the right way, then sure. that's not. Uh, yeah, exactly. if that's the, if that's your motivation, then you don't need to. You don't need to be doing that. Right. So. So you transition into pastoralship. How was that transition? Was it uh, difficult? Where I mean, obviously, there's more of a learning curve. There's different things that you're having to. Now you're dealing with a totally different mindset. Uh, plus, I mean, the benefits of being a revivalist is you go there, you see the fire, and you get to go and start another fire. But the pastor who stays there has to try to continue that fire. 
Well, he has to he has to care for the flock. Sure, you know, as as an evangelist, you go and you know you lead people to Christ, or you you ignite a flame in the in the church, and mm-hmm. then you go to the next church, and you you're. You I do think the that's same. the best job. That'd you do be the awesome. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is. Um, And pregnant pauses are probably not good for podcasts, you well, know, no, the thought, thought process in, in, in that. Um, <clears throat> uh, yes and no. I mean, I've done, I've done both. So I, there, is a, there is a depth that you have in pastoral ministry that you don't have in evangelism because um, you know, personally, um, maybe i wasn't a good evangelist you know i mean because your 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 delivery is different most evangelists are not they're not teaching evangelists sure. you know that that's not what they're there to do right. um, um so <clears throat> you're not really digging into the depths of of the word of god and you know that consistent week after week uh feeding of the flock and anytime you do that 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 deepens who you are as as an individual a pastor grows you know i'm not uh, uh, hopefully that i've had gained spiritual maturity in the 20 years that i've been even here in wichita falls i'm not sure. the same pastor i'm not the same preacher that i was when i came 20 years ago yeah. you know there's there there's hopefully a maturation process and a and you gain an understanding of the word of god i think evan- evangelism or evangelist uh, and there's always been this uh, idea, well, evangelist, it's easy because he's got five sermons in his suitcase and he goes and he preaches the right. same sermons everywhere that he goes. Um, and um, that's good for one year, but the, what are you going to do the second year or third sure. year? So, so obviously you have to... Well, and that's more like, I mean, you still are try to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit. I mean, every you know place, I mean, the... The letters to uh, the churches in Revelations were distinct from one another, you know. So just because you, God might give you a word for one church in one state versus a different, you know. Well, but the flip side of that is true as well, um, because how many people have read the book of, I mean, the letters to the uh, Ephesus and sure. Laodicea, and and yet the message for every generation, you you gain the same thing. Right. So that was my experience as an evangelist. Um, I would go to, a, a, I would preach the same messages in, I mean, obviously, I, you would pray right. as an evangelist, a single evangelist, especially because I wasn't married at the time I did that. I mean, you, you spend the day praying and 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 time in the word i mean you're actually spending more time probably in the word every day yeah and in prayer than you do as a pastor because as sure. a pastor you have other responsibilities but um uh what was my experience was that i might preach the same message in in different churches but many times the result, the fruit of that of that message was the same in every church because yeah. the word of God uh, applies to every life, even though they're in different places. And so, uh, a criticism to say, "Well, you you know, you just preach the same messages in different places." Well, that's because the they need to hear that same. There are people that need to hear that message, and the sure. fruit that it's going to bear is going to be the it's going to be the same. So I never strug- I never struggled with that. I I would never get in the pulpit to preach, just just to preach a sermon. Right. Absolutely. What uh, now? What was your region? Did you were you regional specific, or you just no, just wherever you had an invitation. So you went all over. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously there were some there are regions. I mean, there's a there is a human element to that. You, you get invited by people that you know and recommendations, you know. So sure. So you get in a region and yeah, Pastor Ron gave a good word. Fire, yeah, hey, have him over. Have him over. Sure. That's exactly. And right. he likes apple pie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are states that I didn't. You know, sure. I, I didn't stay in it long enough or wasn't. 
Um, and, and plus, if you spend a, a fourth of your year in Africa, you're you're going to be limited. Yeah. So know, in that home. pursuit of uh, pastoralship, um, and did you become a pastor before you got married? Yes. Okay. And uh, wait a second. Um, no, I, uh, no, actually, I didn't. I, after I finished uh, the evangelism aspect, I came back. And not many people want a single pastor. That's sure. In a, that that door's not open to very many. Or it, I, I think that's incre- maybe increasingly, but back in the 90s, that was not as the that case. That was frowned not upon. My ex- no, it's not my experience, sure. you know, so... So how old were you when you got married? I was 35. 35. Yeah. So okay. um and so I was actually on staff. I had come back and had gone on staff at a church that I'd preached a, a, several revivals at, mm. you know. So there was the opportunity uh, to do that. So going into pastoralship, uh what tell us a little bit about that journey and about the starting point and where you're at now. Kind of walk us through that. What are some of the lessons that you've learned along that way? Just maybe highlight a couple. And, um, I mean. Hmm. Uh, that's a, that's. It's a broad. <laughs> that's yeah. a broad. I was going to so say. Try to narrow it down just a couple. Like, so what are some things, or maybe it, maybe you don't have to. Just keep it broad. What is, what is something that is coming to your mind that you maybe want to share? Um, what were the challenges in the beginning or was it smooth sailing? Well, no, I mean, the, the, the challenges, the, the, the first church that I pastored, um, it, it was a church that had, um, had, had been through, had been through difficulty. Uh, the, the pastor previous to me had experienced more of a moral failure mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was coming into a hurting church, a group of people that were hurting and um, and uh, hurting, disillusioned in some sense in that way, as well as, you know, financially. Um, they didn't tell me the, the week after I was elected, the secretary. They threw you in the fire, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I walked in and the, the secretary said, oh, by the way. and We uh, have no money. <laughs> well, not only did they not have any money, they had... Uh, uh, Twenty five thousand dollars of unpaid nine forty one taxes with awesome. the IRS, so they had the IRS on their uh, yeah on their door. So let's stop there real quick. <laughs> what does the Assembly of God? This is Assembly of God Church, right? Correct. So what does the denomination do? Do they just kind of like, hey, you're on your own lifeboat there? We're not doing nothing, or do, are they helpful in that? Or what's their what's their mindset? Well, uh, actually, they uh, no, they were they they were very helpful in the situation. Yeah. They uh, they loaned us money. the The district loaned yeah, us. Yeah, it's better to owe them instead of the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the interest rate is probably yeah. a, sure. you know, a lot better. So they loaned us the money that we needed to 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 pay that debt. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there are other things where the church was being sued by a, a copier, pay, copier bills they hadn't sure. paid and so forth. But so the, how do you go into that situation? I mean, we are just like, oh, God, what, do you, what am I here? What am I into? Or are you pretty pessim- uh, optimistic? I mean, did you uh, begin to surround yourself with the team? How do you go about um, tackling those issues? Well, I think every young man and every young minister is optimistic. Sure. <laughs> you know, that's just, right. it goes with the territory. Well, I think we should, as Christians, we should be optimistic. Well, it, right. We I should. I, right. I, I believe that. But And, and you have a whole different perspective when right. you're younger. Yeah. Uh, you, you just, the world is... A little naive. In front of you. Yeah. I don't, well, I... I'm, Perhaps, but still just positive because there's just this knowledge, well, if this doesn't work, I can do something else, right. you know, and there's that, there's that uh, confidence. That, and, right. and that changes, by the way, Jeremy, as you get older, because you, you realize your, mort- your mortality and your years sure. of being able to do things. So it, it changes. Uh, the, you, you start seeing through a different lens than you had yeah, before. Yeah, I, I mean, my lens has changed from 20s to 30s to now I'm 42. I mean, my lens is... Sure. Absolutely changed. And more so, I mean, I'm not concerned with death or any of that. I'm not 
that doesn't really ever enter my mind. My idea is, my I, I've said this several times, is I don't want to be um, just bland. Like, I want to leave a mark for the kingdom of God. You know, I don't, my, I think, uh, like, the greatest failure would be average. You know what I mean? Like, you just, he breathed there type of deal you know i want to leave a mark for the kingdom of god that's my ambition so and i think that is uh i think in you know the apostle paul is a great example of um someone that uh he he was it was full throttle mm-hmm. all the time till the day that yeah. he died you sure. know there's there's um um but it is a in, in pastorally. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Right. It is. And so you have to. There's, that's the there's biggest a thing. It's funny that you say that's the biggest thing I learned in the last six years. Like I stopped about seven years ago, about thirty five. I stopped and I said, okay, the way I've been doing things is inefficient. And so efficiency really became a big part of who I am the last seven years because I I started I started thinking, okay, I got to start thinking about the long game. And start building minute blocks to support that long game versus just going out and being just speedy Gonzales about every little thing. And when I began to do that, things completely started changing in business, in my spiritual life, and everything. Because I started thinking, okay, even in my relationships with people, for instance, like I would start okay, I'm not going to just share Jesus with this person, right? Now I'm going to, um, and I think, I mean, I did this to some degree early on, but okay, I'm going to plan out a course of action with this individual. I'm going to invite them out to breakfast. I'm going to give them a book. I'm going to talk to them about that book. I'm going to, so I was more methodical in my long-term, for instance, uh, for um, extended relatives who might be not walking with Christ. So my my perspective was more long-term. Okay, I'm not going to just... They know who I am as a believer, but they're not going to just have a one-on-one conversation with me about Jesus. That's tried and failed. I have to start playing the long game. And so my perspective changed on that. So it's funny that you mentioned the marathon because that's really how my whole mindset is now, is that marathon. That's a great... That's 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 a great perspective. Yeah. Well, it took a long time to get there. I mean, and like you said, you're just, when you're young, you're just like, go, 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 trying to overcome the world. But, you know, there there is definitely wisdom with age, I, I believe that, and experience. No, I, 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 I believe that as well. And cultures, I, the, uh, our American culture doesn't value that like other, other cultures. You talk about missions. I mean, the, the African culture, and I'm sure other cultures, cultures as well my experience with the caribbean culture is that that gray hairs count for something i yeah. mean they they value the wisdom that comes from from their from their elders absolutely yeah i i love talking with elder people I, it just i would much rather talk to somebody of older years than you know some up and coming type of person because their life perspective oftentimes is I I've found also that they they've stopped taking things so seriously too. Like they're more laid back a lot of a lot of older people because they're just like yeah, I they, you can almost see their thought process where like they're like yeah, I remember when I was where you're at. You know, it's like they they recognize uh different things. And I it's unfortunate because I think two things are happen simultaneously within American culture. One I think that um, the younger generations don't value the older generations. And two, I think the older generations don't uh, make, don't take the opportunity to mentor the younger generations as maybe they once did. I think they're, I think it's equal parts to blame and equal parts. I think you could look at both. I mean, it wasn't that long ago where um, in the American culture, you it was not uncommon for grandma and grandpa to live even with family or near family, and they take an active role in different things. And now you have this idea of, hey, let's get a motorhome, let's travel all over the country, and we'll Skype the kids and grandkids so i think there's also and i've had this conversation with lots of older people and brought that up and they they i think there is some validity to that that 
you have to also make yourself available to those younger generations too. I think not to say that there it's huge blame to go around, but I think that there's perspectives different. Well, I think I think too the the w- w- my thought process as you were saying that I, I mean we're two white guys sitting here mm-hmm. having a conversation, and I think I mean culturally uh, America the Hispanic culture very much values their their older people and they oftentimes live with them sure um, well the hispanic I mean, culture values family i think more than white culture no that's what all I, the way across the board yeah but yeah. so they they value their their parents and grandparents sure. and the and they and they take care of them yeah and uh um uh, i would say that's true i, I have more uh, probably knowledge or personal experience with the Hispanic culture than the African American culture, but I, I think that's probably that's probably true as well. Uh, so I, I I mean, whenever we talk about American, I mean, there's a lot sure. of different cultures in America. Well, and I, we're talking about our well, I think, but that, I think it's when you're talking about American, I think you can pretty much broad brush the culture because I mean, you ba- you base it upon percentages, right? And so yeah, is it, you can always throw a minutia. I mean, there's that's never not the case. So when somebody broad brushes something, you could always say, well, but then this culture or this minutia. So I'll push back a little bit on that because, I mean, you can always throw in a minutia. You can always say, well, this culture doesn't do that. But as a whole, as a culture, based upon media, entertainment, things like that, that is the culture. Like that culture is, it does not recognize the elderly and it does, and the elderly do not necessarily, you know, they, they're like, well, they're just young kids who don't care about the elderly. So we're going to do our own thing too. I mean, as a whole, as a culture, based upon what we see through entertainment and media and things like that, that is now, I mean, the Hispanic culture is a minority within the broader, the broader base of America. So that's why I would right say now it is. Sure, and that's that could change at any time. <laughs> sure, I mean, yeah. the, obviously, the demographics and I, it is it does changing. change based upon locale too, you right. know, in specific counties in America, and specific, you know. But you could say the same thing. I mean, you go into northern Minnesota, you're not going to find hardly any Hispanics. So, I mean, it's also locality too, right? You and know? I've never been in northern Minnesota, so yeah, and I'm, all I'm not across the north, that, there's right. not a lot of Hispanics, you know. Yeah, well, and increasingly, I, sure. th- that's true. I. I uh, was in in Quincy, Illinois. That's where I served. It. This was in the early '80s, and you're right. You couldn't find a. There was. They didn't know what Mexican food was. Sure. You know, and so I missed this. Missed the southern. Yeah. But I I I, I agree with that. I mean, I think the, uh, the the affluence of our culture, you know, that leads people to get a motorhome, and there's nothing wrong with having a motorhome no, and right. f- driving across the country. But but you you miss that uh, opportunity to be, to be as involved in the lives of younger younger individuals. Even though in my experience, I find um, speaking just as you and I are sitting here today, you value that. That's my experience. I I, I find others the the younger people that value the older you know the older generation. But that maybe is just a small small window as as comp- opposed to the culture at large sure. that you're talking about. Well, and the reason why I mention that is because like there is a moral decay within this country, right? I mean, I don't know how anybody could not see that. And I think so I'm going to obviously I'm going to I'm going to poke and prod a little bit. Okay. So, and I, this is not a reflection of you, but what I there is a moral decay and whenever somebody oh, like myself or somebody else says, well, this is happening, there's always tends to be the pushback. Well, but this is there's always a counter. And it's like at some point, I think that we have to say, OK, we have to acknowledge our failings as a country, as a culture, as a broader sense and just and, and stop saying, well, yeah, but this and but this, for instance, like. The American Church. If you look at the Pew Research and all these different um, statistics that are out, the American Church within America, uh, across the board, they're in decline. Right, membership is down, uh, reading Bibles down, praying's down, tithing's down. And then when you come to a pastor and say, 
hey, what changes can we be made? Because it would be, in the essence, and across the board, it's yet without fail, the, a minister is typically really quick to uh, to defend, right? Instead of, so it'd be the same sense of, if I was talking to a doctor and I said, hey, you know, the medical field has all these things, it, a doctor would be quick to be saying, wait, hold on, because he's part of that field. And so it's really hard to get past that barrier within the sense, um, you know, I'm in construction, so if somebody came to me and said, well, all the construction trades suck. Well, that's not necessarily true, and I, my natural inclination would be to defend that, right? And I think that there's a natural inclination to, within the American church, to, when I'm talking to pastors, I say, what can we change here to, what do you see the problems are, and things like that, and then every single time, and I, not yet have I had a pastor be like, well, these are some of the changes that we need to make, or something like that. They're always quick to defend, like, well, hold on. And I think that that's an unfortunate thing because I think, for one, I'm not, I, I'm i part of the church. So I don't, I'm not like pastors are here and congregation are here. I think we're all together. We're all a family. We're all one, right? But it, we all have just different titles, roles, relationships, specific jobs within that, the body of Christ. But there, the body of Christ within America is not as strong as I would say it should be. And I think that the moral decay of this country I think it would be a shame. I think it would be a tragedy to not take some of the blame as an, a part of the American church myself. I, we are to blame for some of that, I would have to say. And I'm trying to get to the bottom line of what different things, what went wrong, what are we doing wrong, um, what changes need to be made. Because obviously changes need to be made. I, I, I truly believe that. Um, and even, you know, I had Pastor Jordan on. And he was saying that Assembly of God brought him and some young people in and let, you know, to the assemblies, they, they invited some to say, hey, we, what are some things that we're missing here? Because you look at the demographics, like men across the board, they don't want to go to church. Why is that? Well, for one, I don't, I don't think the church is set up for men. I think that they're kind of pushed to the side in a, in a sense. And I've talked to a lot of men who feel that way, hundreds. And so I just want to get your perspective, and I don't mean to just like throw all this at you in that sense. And once again, I'm not reflecting this all on you. I'm just trying to get your perspective as a pastor who's been in ministry for 40 years of what was that transition? How did that transition take a, take that left turn? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think it's a... Uh, um you say it takes a left turn. I think it's a gradual thing, and that that's that what that's what makes it so insidious. Sure, you know it's not one single thing that turns the culture. It's uh, you know it's a, it's 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 a it's a it's a slight bend, as as you well know. If you're headed in a direction, all it takes is you if if you're flying, for example. All you have to do is get off one degree. Uh, it doesn't take a large variation. And if you stay on that path, by the time you get out uh, 200 miles or 500 miles, you're way off course. Sure. And so in a culture, the same is true. Uh, you know, it, it can be just the slightest, the slightest movement and and obviously, then years. What were out, those movements? The, the fathers. Do you think? Well, I, you know, uh, I, I can bring up the obvious ones. You know, I can bring up when they take prayer out of schools, and and there are things. Even I'm not uh, the, historically. I think you can. I, I'm not a, as great as a history buff, perhaps. Even though I love history, as I, you know, American history, recent American history. I mean decisions in the 50s and 60s. I mean, I think in every ad ad administration of a president, for example, there are decisions that are that are made, uh, and they may not be big things, but th then when you play them out over, you know, a generation, then it, it then you find uh, a, a generation, you find it headed in a way off course and as so opposed to starting it. Looking back then, would you say that the church should have pushed back harder 
on government. I mean, I'm I'm mixed on that because I think if the church is dependent upon the government to lead morality in the sense of, hey, we need to have prayer in schools and things like that, I think that in and of itself is missing. The mark. Yeah, no, I wasn't trying to point to, I mean, I wasn't trying to make it a, a, a government. I was just bringing an instance of something within, sure. you know, within American culture. Uh, within the church, mm, um. I'd have to think about that as far as uh, you know, what what are what are changes what are some of the changes that we have you know that we have made that should we have done those different that would have led us in a different a different path Well and the reason I say that is because I think if we can recognize part of the issue is we oftentimes don't even it's not even finding the answer we don't even know the right question to ask so I think it, once you determine what question to ask, then you can then unravel and try to figure out the answer. Because I still feel that that one degree off, it's still one degree off. Like we haven't made any correctional course as a society or even as a church. What What's actually I've, I've witnessed, seen happen, it seems like the church is like, well, they're way over there. Uh, we should go over there too and try to catch yeah. up. Instead of saying true, they're like, wait, why are they over there one degree off? Or And so the church has then shifted from what it should be doing to shifting towards culture to match up with culture. Well, so the one degree that you could talk about within the church is when did we start, where did the idea that that we need to start chasing the culture, where did that begin? I mean, where, where does it begin that rather than... It, does it begin with pastors? Does it begin with something where someone, you know, and maybe it goes back to the suffering you're talking about. Maybe, maybe there was less suffering. There's less suffering, obviously, when you follow the culture. So, or was it in a decision to, we want to get more, uh, people on the pews, you know, so we make a, we make a slight decision that begins to, that begins to chase what we would call the world. That begins to kind of look that direction, and is I mean, is that the one degree? I mean, I think there are those kinds of decisions that that a church can make, and I think it. I do think it goes back to it. Obviously, as there is, uh, as there is uh, uh, affluence within a culture, and our culture has not experienced persecution as you know, not real suffering. In from a persecution standpoint, um, is that the one degree where is it in is it in preaching a a message or a word to a, a congregation of people? Maybe we've lost that message. You're going to be hated. You're yeah. going to be hated. You expect to suffer for Christ. Suffering is a normal well, that's part of the that's process. Not pre- preached hardly ever. Is well, an aspect of suffering for Christ. So there you go. Yeah. So I mean, it, when you when you take that element out of that, and you know, you know I mean, Jesus was very s- specific with his disciples. If they hated sure. me, they're going to hate you. You well, know. Well, you know, and I when I preached a sermon one time, I I asked I asked the question. I said, "Can I get a show of hands of somebody who has led somebody to Jesus in the last year?" And not one hand was raised in the entire congregation. There's about 200 people there. And I think if you did that throughout most churches in America, I think that you'd have few hands up. I think because people lose sight of what the mission is, of what the Great Commission. And, I mean, I have my own uh, thoughts on this, too, and talking to people. I mean, I see it in entrepreneurship and things like that. I But I think culturally, I think, for me, I think one of the greatest issues that is often ignored, and it goes hand-in-hand hand with Jesus' words, I think... Uh, work ethic is is missing completely and jesus said in the last days the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few and i think when you're seeing in times of like like i remember when i was young you know and i remember my parents tell me my grandparents tell me that hey when the church did something i might mean, everybody was involved in it back in the 60s 70s i mean everybody was like there going through it they had a function everybody worked to for that function so on and so forth I mean, as a pastor, and I've been in ministry before, and I've been on staff and things like that, 
I mean, you see, and it's it's unfortunate, but I would say what ten percent of the church population actually does most of the work. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That and so that, I think you see that, but also just culturally in America, there's a there's just trend of work ethic is lacking. I mean, you're seeing that now. There's more jobs than there are unemployed people right now. I mean, so it's not a lack of jobs, and the jobs are paying more than they've ever paid, but you're still having people wanting to stay at home. Well, I think that, again, I think that goes back to the affluence of our of our society, and of course I'm looking at American culture. Um, I don't know that much about, uh, again, historically, but the Roman culture, you know, they, they reached that point yeah. where they were, uh, and of course, they had a different mentality. They conquered all these other countries, and so they had a lot more labor force. That, uh, but but the the Romans themselves were not doing right. They had slaves. Like they would go conquer people and have slaves and put them in conscript as workers too. Yeah, and so when you're not working, when you all you have is leisure, and I I think that when there's when a um, um, you know the scripture talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and it talks about the sins of Sodom being, being a, a pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. You know when you have idle, when you have a, a society that is idle, that is not that's that's always going to contribute to the decay. I mean to the decay. Yeah. I mean work is good for us. Oh, it's you know imperative. work is work yeah. is good for every you know for every person which in uh, I don't I don't know that I mean you can't find a biblical basis for retirement either. No. No. <laughs> Not really. I mean Not really. No. I actually was having this conversation with a with a guy that's a regional manager for a food chain yesterday. And uh, he's a Christian, a believer, and and that was that that conversation that conversation came up that uh, you know there's give me chapter and verse for yeah. uh, uh, for uh, there being retirement. Yeah, I, 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 there is no and work even well even physical motion. Sure, you know for older people, people who become. Uh, stationary or uh, the, well, the my wife's secretary? grandfather was building houses at eighty five. Yeah, I mean, and, he was working until the day he died. And, and see, I know a yeah. guy that's uh, um, a guy here locally that built houses. <clears throat> he was uh, he was a, a framer of a house, uh, and I mean, he was you know, he's well known in the community as far as being a framer. And he, I think, he framed his last house when he was I don't know eighty eight. Yeah. 89 so you know that's but and if you see him now he's 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 in his 90s he's he's healthy yeah you know and obviously there are some people who are genetically they don't have good sure. health <clears throat> and so you can't you know you can't point to that but but there are a lot of people that you know, if i don't if i don't work or exercise you'll get to where you can't move yeah. Yeah. so we were created for we were created for motion, created to, to, to move, and that is a downfall within our culture. I think it's a downfall within our church. I think, you know, I, I wish that was talked about more often, but if you look at who God called, I mean, he called Moses when he was tending the flock. He t- called Elijah when he was plowing a field. He called the disciples when they were fishing. I mean, he was calling people while they were working oftentimes. You know, and I think there's this there's a a huge connection between labor and the kingdom of God. I mean, it is not something that is just simply that you just simply go about and do. I mean, there are those situations where you can share the gospel and it it does come easy. But I mean, I think that we are here on this earth to work for the kingdom of God in the sense that it it is labor intensive. And I don't know if we have, as an American church anymore, that mindset. No, I, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think, and and if you talk about something being built in the DNA, you have to go all the way back to the building, or back to the beginning, when God put Adam in the garden, what did he, Adam and Eve didn't just lounge around lounge around yeah. I, it was their responsibility to tend to the garden yes you know and so he gave response he, he gave him a job basically right. he created him and gave him a job it it's so that's it's built into it it's built into all of us and as it relates to the church 
yeah, I can, I, I can, and you go back then to the, our American idea of retiring and getting in an RV and traveling across the country, um, or living. And again, there's, everyone needs rest. Sure. You know, you need, you need vacations and times away that rejuvenates. So I'm not, uh, you know, no, I'm not. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not saying, hey, we should just be in a constant state of suffering. I mean, that's not what I'm proposing. But I also don't think we should be in a constant state of leisure either. No, you know, that's what I am proposing. We don't need to be there. So, uh, jump back. So, where are you at now in ministry? Well, where I'm at in ministry, I'm in transition. Uh, I can't tell you what that transition looks like yet. I'm I'm trying to discover that. It's uh, you don't know what you're going to do. So you're no, I really don't. You're not going to be pastor. I'm not of going to this, be. I'm not church. going to no, no. Okay. And uh, uh, and and I haven't regretted that decision. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it's uh, did it, was that a. Uh, was there something that led up to that? Was that just a prayerful thing? Was that something that God spoke to you? How did you come to that decision? No, I think that's a process. I, I th- so the, so I'm not going to say that the decision we we tend to spiritualize everything. Sure, absolutely. You know, we we do tend to spiritualize everything. Um, and and so in this, I you know, we all are. Uh, I think there's a humanity that's involved in in in, in every one of us, in all of us. So, uh, two years from now, I may have a more um, insightful perspective about that. It's kind of like when you're in the middle of something, you you tend not to see as clearly about that sure. as uh, as you hindsight. What, the old I mean, saying was it hindsight burnout is or? 2020. 2020. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I don't know that I can identify that yet. I think you have to get past that. That's why I'm saying hindsight. Yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you can kind of tend to see clearly more than you do, right? So I'm probably too close to, to identify that. Obviously, you don't want to say that. I don't want to say that I, I don't think I'm, there's I'm leaving the church because, uh, because I burned out um i don't think there's anything i think that once again i think because there are a lot of pastors who get overwhelmed i think that goes back to the labor issue of i think that there's oftentimes pastors are doing more than they should too much well i think you again i think you have uh uh and and this depends on on the individual pastor as well i mean you talked about and i i really commend you as far as making those steps and in your personality jeremy too you are you are a do or this would be my perception of that but you're you you're not afraid of work and afraid of doing things but you're also someone that knows how to enlist others to delegate and to enlist others to do yeah. work that's, i mean well you get more a, done well the efficiency it, is the key right yeah. but that's but that's also a strength of your personality sure. you you see that and you in, engage that that's not a strength of my personality and so that in turn probably uh, our weaknesses carry over sure. into a so my weakness is individually as a pastor or as a person, and we all have them. I have Absolutely. them. Uh, th- those those weaknesses translate into the life of the church whenever you stay for a period of time. You know, but you, well, I commend you, you for saying that. I think that's big of you to say that because a lot of people aren't real enough. You know, oh, well, you can't. I can't blame when you've been someplace twenty years. I can't. I can't blame the previous pastor because sure. they. Uh, some of them did have a previous pastor, but I I can't blame that. So you have to be very real in yeah. saying the the weaknesses that a church has are due to a lack of leadership in those particular areas. And and so the only the only perfectly well rounded human being was Jesus Christ. Sure, you know he's the well, only I one that well rounded in every come, way. You know, yeah, our well roundedness comes from the people we put around us. Hopefully, right No, and know. that's that's where leadership. So uh, uh, that's where good leaders they hire to their weaknesses. Yeah, you know the what what they're not good at, and uh, they hire to their weaknesses. And they're not so so a good leader in my mindset is not threatened. Sure, uh, he's not threatened by his weaknesses, and he's not a, threatened by acknowledging that, and he's not threatened then by people who can do things better than he can. 
Sure. Um, uh, that that just adds to his. That just strengthens him. And and so a man that is threatened by someone, he hires someone to do a job, and then he works all the harder to to prove that he is. Well, that's 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 foolish yeah. that's you hire someone let them do it let them let them be your strength let them be your arm or your leg they're good at that god's gifted them to do that let them do that and you do what you're good at yeah. you know what are your predictions for the american church in the next 5 years i mean i don't think that the american church is headed in the right direction mm-hmm. I, I i mean i culturally again we're talking sure. about being influenced by culture but i think biblically too paul's writings to uh, the church at corinth and other places he was writing to, to to the church he was writing to churches that were were being influenced in part by the culture absolutely and and so I, that's, that's always what he was going a, to occur. That's what he was addressing. Sure. You know, he was addressing that. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I think some of the I I I do believe that our shift. You talked about a moral decay. I mean, our our shift in some of those. I mean, obviously, it's it has accelerated. Uh, I mean, exponentially. Yeah. There are things that our culture and things are concerned, and I think it will. I think it will creep into the church. Sure, um, that that we will embrace some things that uh, are harmful. Well, not only harmful that are just in my mind heresy. Uh, no, I mean just well that are just totally not uh, biblical. Sure, you know uh, a lot of those. A lot of those moral issues that are out there, and some of the things that our culture. Are yeah, I think we're seeing a now. trend up with universalism and things like that already, um, which is the multiple paths to heaven. And as a culture becomes more secular, too, I mean, you know, hedonism and all that stuff becomes much more prevalent within yeah. the within the culture, and we're and we're seeing that and. And the guard against that is in 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 the in the church, the watching and being aware that the church is going to be influenced sure. by that. Would you die for your faith? I want to say yes. Yeah, I think all of us say yes. Um, I mean, I I think again, being real and being honest. You know, we we can all be like Peter. Lord, I'll die for you. But I'll, he did. Uh, uh, well, uh, he eventually did. But the first yeah. time he said that, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he thought, first three times he yeah. thought he said sure. uh, he thought he was ready to do yeah. that, and 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 what enabled him to do that? It was the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Sure. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think that. Well, is, I think that, yes and no. I I think that people can make that resolute. I mean, I believe in free will. I believe that you can make that. I mean, yes, will the Holy Spirit help you in that for sure? But I do think it takes away from the the decision that I decide I will die for Christ. Like, I will make that decision. I, I, I can't. I think Peter, I think it wasn't all Holy Spirit. I think he made those guys made those decisions well no obviously they yeah. did and i i think they reach a point and and you're right i think there are all, there are all we all have hills that we will die on sure and i have hills theologically that i'll die on i mean i don't care where the culture goes I'm, right i'm not going to shift away from what i know that the word of god says is true and so whatever the consequences of that are culturally and i think that's where the church has to be i think the church has to stay to truth to the truth of the word of god what the word of god says Mm -hmm. it isn't it isn't ambiguous i mean it's very clear in some of the issues that our culture is dealing with now and so i think you you have those you have to make a decision that uh, this is this is where I'm at, and I'm not moving from this, and whatever whatever that means, that's that's what it means. So, yeah. so you know, I want to say, will I die for my faith? Of yes, yeah. Uh, but I will also say, whenever you're in a because it was, there can be an eye opener. I was in a, I was in a situation in um, in what's it been two years ago now that we were in 
in a country in Africa, and we were in a uh, we were in a area where Al Qaeda was very active, mm-hmm. and um, um, we were trying to be discreet. Discreet, come in under the radar. What we were doing, though, and and it's just part of that uh, culture that when you're, anytime you're building a school or you're building, sure, this happened to be a building a home for uh, uh, abused and you know women in in uh, we were building a dormitory or laying the foundation for that, putting up the steel structure for that. And uh, of course, they want to have a big celebration. You know, yeah. they bring in the mayors and different things, and so that brings attention. It brings attention and brought attention to where the 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 city leaders said, "You got to get your people out of here." So we we left four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, sure. one morning under the cover of darkness. And well, and, I think and that night was too. that night was long though. Yeah. What I'm saying to you, Jeremy, is because it was a very real. It was, it was a very real and present danger. And so I don't think until you are thrust into the moment of that that you deal with that, you face the you you face that you face that reality. It's one thing to talk about it it's quite another thing to actually be in that moment and then facing sure. it in that. And um, um, Do you think that we need to begin to put our minds in those positions? And, like, I, I, I mean, I, for one, I've talked about this on previous podcasts, that we need to, I believe it, it's our responsibility as believers to put our minds, like, uh, in that position, in that spot of, am I willing? We need to ask those questions. You know, when my wife and I were doing marriage counseling, we part of the marriage counseling was we went through scenarios. What would you do? It was very helpful because what would you do if a, a spouse died? What would you do if you had a child born and they died? How And talking through that, even though that might not happen, actually prepared my wife and I as a marriage to understand each other's thinking and how we would handle that, right? And so I think it's beneficial for for Christians to put their put themselves through those. Do you do you think that we should be doing that like asking those questions of ourselves? Well, I mean, you're coming back to the larger subject of suffering, which has kind of been the 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 whole idea, mm-hmm. the, the subject that you said we all avoid in mm-hmm. doing that. And that's uh no, I do think it's helpful. I think I, I think you ought to to stick your head in the sand about anything and not address the 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 subject or the issue of that. We do it in other ways, you know. You, I, I don't know what they did when you were in elementary school. You know, we had fire drills and we had uh, well, we had tornado drills. Yeah, we had know? earthquake drills because we grew up in Southern California. So well, th- this was yeah. this was Oklahoma. So we had tornado drills, sure. which was actually crazy to get in the hallway and right. and put your hands over your neck. I mean. It's it's, but it 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 was it was a preparation in the event of you know there's the 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 muscle muscle memory you know there are certain things you do I think part of the military training is just uh, I mean they reflex it's reflex yeah. it's they just something they automatically do it's without thought process and so to not have those kind of conversations uh, I I would agree with you is 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 uh, is not wise. I think I, I I believe I believe you ought to. We ought to have those kinds of conversations. You know, it's just like having conversations with your kids about all those kinds, your sure. mortality and and their mortality and different things. It it helps to prepare. It helps to face them to face those things. Last question: What do you do? You feel like we need to? I mean, I think there's biblical answers for this, but your perspective as an American church, how do we foster and lay the fertility for revival? Everything begins with prayer. Mm -hmm. And whenever I'm talking about prayer, I'm not just talking about what you pray over your meal, you know, at, um, at dinner, but, um, 
Uh, so and I'm thinking about the, the what moves us to prayer. Uh I think desperation. I, I think desperation. And so, you know, revival um comes a lot of times revival if you talk about an individual revival is birthed out of out of difficulty Mm -hmm. you know when people are desperate for god revival oftentimes comes out of a desperation for you know for god and when we turn our hearts there's there has to be something that turns our hearts towards god you know in the day that we seek him we find him you know his promises to those that uh that uh that if to those that seek him he reveals himself to that and so what causes us to seek him um i mean our, uh, culturally the dangers to what causes us not to seek him is comfort and being able to do things on our own and uh all the things that we describe as far as being within our within our culture. So while I do believe that you it's it's easy to have an I mean it, it's easy to have an answer to to tell a church, okay, we need to have revival and the way we need to we're going to call for prayer meetings, we're going to call for these kinds of things. But there has to be a there has to be a want to and a desperation within the hearts of, of people. Now I do believe that that uh, uh, godly people uh, can can pray and the and the spirit of God begins to work in the hearts of yeah of individuals. And, and but do you that think happens. the collective heart of the American church is there? I don't. I mean, if we're no, honest, yeah. no, I don't. I don't know. I don't believe so yeah. because again, it goes back to all the things we've been talking about sure. the 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 comfort and the ease and the and um, um, can I? Well, I mean, I we have to obey as well. Sure, you know, it's not just being hearers of the word is not a is not enough. You have to be a doer of the word. You have to do what you hear. You yeah. have to be willing to apply what you hear. And so I'm not sure that that real revival will happen without there being difficulty. Yeah. Do you do you anticipate that difficulty? I do. Yeah. I mean, I believe I obviously I believe that that uh, uh, culturally, politically, you know, and it's not just in American culture. I mean, the persecution that is uh, that is a, occurring in other. Uh, countries and and in fact in mid, some countries that has been you know a, a church that is birthed in in persecution has uh you know they've they have a whole different perspective yeah. about church and following jesus and all of that than we do well i really appreciate you uh coming on i want you to know i appreciate everything that you've done and uh i love you and i know god has great things in store for you coming up and uh, I'm interested to see what that is. Uh, Me too. I'll have you. I'll have you back <laughs> on for sure. So, yeah, um, yeah. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. This yeah. five minutes has quite passed quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely has. So, thank you so much again. You bet. Yeah.